Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. We're going to be doing something a little different today. I'm going to be hosting this episode by myself while I tell you my top 100 greatest films of all time. James and I were both inspired by the Empire Top 100 Movies of All Time list and we didn't really agree with it at all. So, And a lot of fans reached out to us and were like, what were you guys' top 100 films of all time? And James and I have different tastes in films, so we both are making our own lists. This is my list, and James will has will have his list coming out uh, next Tuesday, so keep an eye out for that. Now, I made a list of films that I grew up with, film that films that you know had a huge impact on me as a young person. And in terms of film history, I think it's important to always look to the classics, not even just like the typical Gone with the Wind class, classics, Casablanca cat classics, but there are a lot of really important films that came out in the early 1900s, um, a lot of silent pictures, great films from the 50s and 60s that not pe many people are still really talking about. So I have a lot of films on this list from international countries as well. I think I have accounted 40 international films. I was really disappointed with how few international films were on the Empire list. So I wanted to give some love to the great foreign films that have come out over the last uh, 100 years or so. And a lot of these you might not have heard of, but if you find them interesting, I hope you can check them out. I'm going to do my best to summarize each film in like 30 seconds or so, just so I don't make this a three hour episode. So let's get go. Let's just dive right into it. So let's start with, I'm going to go 100 to number one. So my top 100, starting from 100, I'm going to go with the Romanian film, four months, three weeks, two days. This came out in 2007 and was written and directed by Christian Mungu. This is a phenomenal film about uh, abortion, which is a controversial issue still to this day and still relevant in conversations all over the world. And in this film is a devastating take on that in a country where abortion was illegal. A young woman has to try and find an abortion. It's a really dark, really well acted, uh, filmed beautifully. It's a really incredible film. So check out four months, three weeks, and two days. At number 99, I have The Piano, which came out in 1993 and was directed by Jane Campion, one of my favorite directors. She's an excellent filmmaker, has made a really impressive filmography so far. She's also done some TV work like Top of the Lake, Top of the Lake but this film is really phenomenal. It's a, a beautiful story about uh, a mother who's deaf and how she's trying to overcome that with a young daughter, played by Anna Paquin, who's one of the, if not the youngest Oscar-winning child of all time. I think she was... 13 or 12 or something maybe even younger and she won the oscar for supporting actress really terrific film definitely check that out that's my number 99 then at 98 i have the brazilian film city of god uh, you hear this a lot on lists it's it deserves all the recognition it gets it's a really fantastic film it tells a coming of age story in a dark place that you know western civilizations we grew up in relative comfort and uh, this is a, a portrayal of a young kid who's dealing with life on the streets and how to get out of it this film came out in 2002. It was directed, written and directed by Fernando Merieles and Katiana Lund. City of God, number 98. Then at 97, I have Nashville. This is a 1975 Robert Altman, Altman film. This really showcases what the world of like Southern music is like, country music, and really great ensemble cast, terrific film, filmmaking, uh, really solid all-around film. Love the music. It's a, I'm not a country fan, really. Of music I never really listened to it but I think this film is absolutely amazing so Robert Altman's film Nashville then at 96 I have Wings of Desire which came out in 19, 1987 directed by Wim Wenders this is a terrific foreign film if you've seen the Nicolas Cage film where he plays an angel who falls in love with I think it's Meg Ryan's character it's a remake of this movie but this one is by far the superior film it's beautiful black and white filmmaking really terrific acting Great, great cinematography. Really powerful film, Wings Wings of Desire. And then at 96, I have Jordan Peele's Get Out, which came out in 2017. Really unbelievable film. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have seen it. This was such a big hit. Jordan Peele came onto the big screen in a massive way. We've always been, I've always been a fan of his from Key and Peele, super talented writer and, and actor and filmmaker, but he really blew me away with Get Out. Social commentary, terrific story, surprising great horror, good gore. I think he just 
knocked it out of the park, hit everything he was going for. It's just a really perfect movie. So that's my number five, 95 pick. At number 94, I have Itu Mama Tambien, which was written and directed by Alfonso Colon and came out in 2001. Cuarón is one of my favorite filmmakers. He's got a couple of movies on this list. He's really amazing filmmaker. Itamama Tambien is one of my favorite coming-of-age films. It's about two, two young guys who go on a road, tra- road trip with an older woman. Uh, it's very funny, very sexually charged, uh, really great conflict, great emotional stakes. and It's about you know dark themes mixed with light themes. And Alfonso Cuaron, it's not his debut, but it's one of his early films, and he made this before Azkaban. I think he really stunned international audiences with this movie. Shot with his standard handheld format. Makes you feel like you're there, documentary style. It's really, really fun movie. Really powerful movie as well. So check out Itumama Tambien. Now at 93, I have Fish Tank, which is another coming-of-age film. This came out in 2009 and was written and directed by Andrea Arnold. It's about a young girl who's trying to get out of the projects in her city. She lives in the UK. It's a really, really terrific coming-of-age film about a, a girl who... You know, is dealing with uh, abuse from her mother's boyfriend who is uh, seducing her. Really complicated themes. Really well done. Again, this film is also shot handheld documentary style. Very gritty, very realistic. Terrific debut performance. Fish Tank, number 94. Definitely check it out. 93, I'm sorry. At number 92, I have Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee's terrific film. This is a racially charged film, still relevant to this day, all around the world. came out in 1989. Uh, this really catapulted him into fame. It's a really terrific day. It's a really terrific film also. He does great act, great acting in it. Phenomenal cinematography, super fun script, uh, heavy themes, but he tied it all together perfectly. At number 91, I have the Grand Budapest Hotel, Wes Anderson's amazing film. I think this is the pinnacle of Wes Anderson and what his filmmaking can bring to the big screen. I know a lot of people aren't huge fans of his. It's an acquired taste, but his humor is really spot on here. Uh, He had a big budget to work with. It's beautiful, well-made, well-crafted, everything from costume, production design, cinematography, the acting. Ray Fiennes really stuns in this movie. He's so funny. And he chews up that Wes Anderson dialogue really well. He seems like a perfect fit in that world. I think that this is Wes Anderson's best film. I'm not sure if he'll be able to top it, especially after seeing The French Dispatch, where he had even more resources at his disposal. But it's not quite the caliber of the film that Grand Budapest is. So I would put Grand Budapest as my Wes Anderson list, on Wes Anderson film on this list at number 91. And then at number 90, I have E.T., The Extraterrestrial which came out in 1982, directed by Steven Spielberg. I'm sure most of you have seen this. It's a really quintessential American film. I think it's the best uh, children's movie of all time. Uh, I think E.T., the character and you know the, the practicality of it, it's so fun. It's so relatable. You end up loving this creature. Uh, really great story. Great young actors. Uh, perfect directing from Steven Spielberg, Spielberg, like always. And then one of John Williams' most memorable scores. I mean... Who everyone knows the ET theme. It's it's beautiful. It's really fantastic. And then when the kids are riding on their bikes, and they are lifted into the air by ET, and that beautiful score is playing. It's really really fantastic. At number eighty nine, I have Mad Max Fury Road, which came out in two thousand fifteen, written and directed by George Miller. This is on this list because it is a, a perfect movie from start to finish, and I think it's you could say it's the the greatest action film of all time. I don't think anything can top it from a production standpoint, a stunt work standpoint, practicality. I mean, everything's for real. There's so little CGI. They spent most of their CGI on like fixing the background to make it look like more of a desert because where they shot, there were lots of hills and um, lots of mountains in the background, so they had to erase those. So they changed the exterior environment, but everything that you see that crashes, that burns, that blows up, that flies in the air it's all real people and machine and you know it's just uh amazing to behold what george miller did because he made three of these films um a while back and they're awesome but you can see that like he was always limited by how small the budgets were and how few resources he had and how you know 
the filmmaking in terms of creating stunt work was still not quite where it is now. And now to see his full vision on display was really magnificent. This movie is really balls to the walls, fantastic. At number 88, we have Un Prophet, which came out in 2009, directed by Jacques Adouard. This is a really amazing French film. I think it's the best prison film of all time. And I, I do think it tops Shawshank Redemption. I love Shawshank, but Un Prophet is a really stunning film. It's devastating. So powerful, dark, violent, gritty. It feels like so graphic and it's a terrific transformative piece for the lead character. Definitely recommend checking out Un Prophet by Jacques Audouard. At number 87, I have The Deer Hunter, which came out in 1981, directed by Michael Camino. And this is a Robert De Niro starring film with Meryl Streep and Christopher Walken. First of all, it's so fun to see these actors so young together. And on top of that, you have one of the best war movies of all time. It shows the the effects of war on, on these men. A couple of them were taken prisoner, has terrible effects on them. And also the aftermath of when they come home. You know, Robert De Niro is the lead of this film. Really beautiful film filmmaking, really in- incredible script, great characters. Meryl Streep is stunning, like always, and uh, Christopher Walken's really sensational. But this is De Niro's movie. He really holds it together. And, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you got to check it out. Because people who sleep on Robert De Niro, they haven't seen movies like this. And it's really a phenomenal performance. All right, at number 86, I have Star Wars A New Hope, which came out in 1977, written and directed by George Lucas. You all know the, you all know the story. Star Wars changed cinema forever, you know. It um, brought the what Stanley Kubrick did with sci-fi and made it more of a mainstream story. Had the fantasy element to it, the action-adventure element to it. And what he did was really groundbreaking, and there's a reason why, you know, still to this day, so many people are obsessed with this world because it's one of the greatest worlds ever created in fiction. And it has, I think, endless potential, you know. And I'm very excited to see what they keep doing. They've been doing a great job in the past couple of years. And also, you know, just lightsabers in space. It's friggin' awesome. It's basically samurai in space, essentially. It's super fun. So Star Wars A New Hope is definitely going to be on your list. At number 84, I have seven which came out in 1995, directed by David Fincher. I think this is the best uh, serial killer film ever. I think it's a really, really great script. Disturbing. Uh, it's graphic. It's so well directed and so well acted. He, I mean, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman together, but then you have Kevin Spacey's, I think, career best performance, you could say, even though he has so little screen time, but he's really, really magnetic on screen. It's a devastating ending. I think that in terms of the police procedural, this really knocked it out of the park. And, you know, I think that Seven and maybe another movie or two really inspired the police procedural becoming like a network television thing. Um, Law and Order was still like pretty new in its infancy. So I think like shows like CSI and CIS really drew from Seven. And man, what what a stunning film. And that ending still shakes you to your core. At number 84, I have Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which came out in 1980. We did an episode on this. It's a really amazing film. It's revolutionary, and there's a reason why so many people are still obsessed with it. It's really just groundbreaking. No one had ever seen anything like it before, and Kubrick's directing is still being like analyzed to this day. It shows a, a testament to his genius. and you know, I think this is one of the scariest movies ever made, but also it's one of the most interestingly crafted movies ever made. It's really fascinating to to watch it over and over again and try and find the clues, try and find the things that he was trying to sneak in there. And it's fun to hear the conspiracy theories and all that crazy madness. But The Shining is one of my favorite movies. I have it at 84 for greatest ever made, but I would say it's lower in my favorites. This list is more of what I think are the greatest films ever made. Um, but The Shining, I would put lower as my one of my favorite movies. At number 83, I have Stalker. This is Andrei Tarkovsky's film. It came out in 1979. This is one of the most well-filmed movies of all time. It's a really stunning piece. His filmmaking is very meditative. It's about this man who's gone on a journey. It has a blend of sci-fi mixed with the 
the mesmerizing quality of the dramatic nature of the story is hard to pin down. I think it's so mysterious and so elegant and disturbing at times, but it's a really special movie. No one really made movies like this guy did. Number 82, I have The Handmaiden. This was directed by Park Chan-wook and came out in 2016. Uh, this is actually a recent film that I really adore. It's a terrific, terrific movie. Uh, Park Chan-wook is one of my favorite filmmakers. He's South Korean. If you haven't seen his movies, he's made films like Old Boy and a bunch of others. This movie is really beautiful, so well filmed, dark, disturbing, graphic, sexual, thrilling, great character, uh, great characters, uh, amazing costuming, really, really beautiful costuming, and such an interesting story with twists and turns, not just one twist, but like it keeps like turning you around. And you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? It's so unpredictable. It's such a great movie. I It's one of my favorite movies made in the last 10 years for sure. So you got to check it out. All right, at number 81, I have Dances with Wolves, directed by Kevin Costner. Now, I know what you're thinking. I actually was late to this movie. I assumed, without even really looking into it, that this was like a white savior movie, but it's not. When I finally watched it, I saw that this movie was really a celebration of uh, the indigenous people's cultures. Um, Kevin Costner even was... Uh, given like a special award within the Sui tribe and granted like a, he's become, he became like an honorary member of the tribe because of how well he portrayed their society and their culture. It's a really beautiful film. Um, it shows the early days of this country being born. But I think that his embracement, his character's embracement of this new culture, which was originally an enemy of his, and now he's grown to love and want to live in it and sacrifice his life to protect it, Really beautiful story. It's got some really amazing filmmaking, including one of the greatest action sequences I've ever seen where the the tribe goes on this gigantic buffalo hunt where they swarm like a herd of like thousands of buffalo for real. And this is no CGI. This is, this is 1990. There's no CGI. And they really did hunt the buffalo in the scene. And it's really one of the most stunning sequences I have ever seen in my life. You have to check out Dances with Wolves. At number 80, I have Heat, which came out in 1995, directed by Michael Mann. This is, uh, I think, the ultimate cops and robbers movie. And I put, I mean, it might surprise you that it's on this list, but it really is one of the finest crafted crime dramas ever put on film. Michael Mann's best film, and he has some really, really good movies, but this movie is just perfect to the T, so well directed, so well acted by De Niro, Al Pacino, Val Kilmer, Ashley Judd, great, great cast. I mean, it has the best bank robbery scene of all time, and then it also has the best shootout scene of all time. And what Michael Mann did was really special. It's tried, so many people have tried to imitate this movie, but nobody still to this day has not even come close. So the next closest thing you could say is like maybe the town has a few scenes that are pretty close to it, but it's barely there. I think Heat is a really sensational crime film. All right. At number 79, I have Brokeback Mountain, Ang Lee's film, which came out in 2005. This is one of the best romance films ever made. It's really devastating, really powerful, really emotional. For me, it's, sometimes it's hard to watch because of how tragic it is. Um, I, it always like devastates me by the end. In that final, the final scene, in that final shot, I mean, it gets me every time with the shirt and with the window. It's two really incredible performers. Heath Ledger, Jake Gyllenhaal, and then the supporting cast is so good. Ang Lee's direction is really, really remarkable. It's very different from what he used to, usually does. Like He went from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon to this, so it couldn't be more different. But he really did make one of the greatest films of this century for sure. And then at number 78, I have Dunkirk, which came out in 2017, directed by Christopher Nolan. For Christopher Nolan's filmography, he's made so many great films, and I think Dunkirk, Dunkirk will stand the test of time as being one of his best. It's really one of the greatest war films ever made. When you can look at the way he approached it, the way he told the story, the way he filmed it, the craftsmanship, uh, you know, the cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema, shooting on that big format film, you know, 
as little CGI as possible. I mean, I think his ability to, to actually f capture these dog fights and make you feel like you're a pilot, make you feel like you're in those boats, make you feel like you're on those planes, make you feel like you're on that beach waiting to die. He just crafted this perfect piece of a story that we never really knew too much about outside of the UK. I had never heard the story before a few years ago. And it's really an important story for World War II. And I think he did an amazing job telling this, portraying this film. It's really a standout in his filmography, and that's really saying something. At number 76, I have L'Enfant, which came out in 2005, directed by Jean-Pierre and Luc Dardenne. These are a pair of uh, Belgian brothers who make a bunch of, they've made a bunch of great films in Belgium and France. Uh, this film is really, really well done. It's about a man who sells his recently born son for money, thinking it's a, a good thing and dealing with the consequences of that and also his girlfriend trying to deal with that as well. The Dardens are a couple of my favorite filmmakers. They capture um, low like people who you know are just on the lower class of the social structure in Belgium in the UK. Uh, their films are shot documentary style because they started out as documentary filmmakers and they're always so beautiful with long takes and they feel so real, so gritty, so raw. This film is really special. This is one of the early films that got me to fall in love with foreign films. Uh, and it's really an incredible experience to watch this movie for the first time. I highly recommend L'Enfant, directed by the Dardenne's brothers. Next up at 75... I have The Talented Mr. Ripley, which came out in 1999, directed by the late Anthony Mangella. Anthony Mangella was a terrific director. He also made The English Patient with uh, Ray Fiennes. And The Talented Mr. Ripley, I think, is just a perfect, stunning movie. I love the, the filmmaking. I love the locations. I love the actors, the story. It's such a great take on a serial killer. Um... Matt Damon, really, really underrated performance by him. I mean, you get Kate Blanchett, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, all these actors so young. It's pretty crazy. It's a really, really terrific story. It's so well done. I, I've seen it so many times. I just, there's something about it. I just can keep watching it endlessly. I have, it's, it has this attractive quality to it, like the music. The just I like hanging out with these characters, and I like watching these scenes take place, and I mean, I think it's just expertly crafted for a film. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend The Talented Mr. Ripley. All right. Now, at 74, I have One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, directed by Milos Forman, which came out in 1975. Uh, incredible Jack Nicholson movie. This won the big five in terms of lead actor and actress, director, screenplay, and best picture. This film has so much heart to it. Uh, it's so funny. It's so dramatic. It's got high conflict. It's got really beautiful moments and really devastating moments. And it has one of the most tragic endings I've, I've ever seen in a film. It's it's devastates me every time I see it. And and Jack Nicholson really is terrific. And Nurse Ratchet is one of the greatest films of all time. It's a really sensational picture. Next up at number 73, I have 12 Years a Slave. Steve McQueen directed this film and it came out in 2013. I think this is uh, the greatest slavery movie ever made. I, Django Unchained is really great, and Amistad is really great too. But I think that 12 Years a Slave really will stand the test of time as being uh, the greatest film depicting this world, um, this moment in history. Uh, Steve McQueen brought so much to it. There's so much nuance in this story. Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor is a really, really fantastic actor, and it was great to see him lead this really big, really important film. Amazing filmmaking, production design, costume, the supporting cast, fast bender. You know, uh, this really, really sensational movie. It's a, it's a tough movie to watch. I've only seen it twice because I just get emotional throughout the entire thing. Like the whole, the whole movie, I just constantly welling up, and so it's hard to sit through this film. It's really devastating, and I think that's what a testament to Steve McQueen's directing and his approach to telling the story. It's so powerful. It really is. It's one of the best films ever made. Now, at number 72, I have Old Boy, which came out in 2003 and was directed by Park Chan-wook, another one of his films. This is 
a crazy movie. It's got some amazing cinematography, one of the best fight scenes ever, really interesting story, really terrific character. And, I mean, I think it has quite possibly the greatest twist of all time in film, if not, like, top three twists between this psycho and maybe one other. This movie is crazy. you got to check it out if you haven't seen it. Terrific villain as well. And at number 71, I have Gladiator, Ridley Scott's film, which came out in 2000. It's really a perfect movie, and I think it's the ultimate hero story movie. There's a, been a bunch of movies like that, especially, you know, Swords and Sandals type movies like Spartacus, you know, Ben-Hur, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, you know. Um, but I just think that Gladiator, it has so much, it, it, it does so much right. It's got a great villain, action, production, sets, costuming. Uh, Russell Crowe is a perfect lead in this film. He's, like I think, the ultimate hero. Really terrific cast. Like Connie Nielsen's really great in this film. And then Hans Zimmer's brilliant score and just the story you know the transformation of the character what he goes through um, general to slave to uh, free man really really amazing movie it's, it's just to this day it's still one of my favorite it's one of my favorite movies i i love watching this i can watch it endlessly and i love listening to the music i think this is um, one of ridley scott's greatest films and it's just i they don't make movies like this anymore a movie like this it, they've tried to make it here and there, but they will never duplicate what he did. All right, at number 70, I have The White Ribbon, which is an Austrian film. came out in 2009, written and directed by Michael Haneke. He's one of my favorite directors working today. He's really sensational. He makes both Austrian and French films. Uh, there's a few of his films on this list because he's really remarkable of a filmmaker. But The White Ribbon is a really, really terrific film. It's about the small village and the problems that occur within it. This film has a terrific villain, great cast, especially this cast is mostly comprised of young actors, and they really did a terrific job. Uh, shot in black and white, it's beautiful lighting, beautiful cinematography. I mean, the production, how the camera moves, really terrific script. Uh, I, it's just full of surprises, and it's pretty disturbing too. I, but I just think that Michael Haneke, he's such a great, patient filmmaker. He really knows how to tell a story, and I think that he's one of my favorites of all time, so... You got to check out both his work and The White Ribbon. At number 69, I have Saving Private Ryan. Uh, I think you've all probably seen this. It came out in 1999, directed by Steven Spielberg. Uh, it could quite, quite possibly be the greatest war film ever made. Uh, Spielberg, unlike any other filmmaker, really transported you into the front lines, uh, made you feel like you were right there with the soldiers trying to take over this beach, trying to charge down a field trying to defend this village. Um, it, uh, no other filmmaker has ever gone as close to Spielberg as making you feel like you were in war with these men. It's really terrific. So well done, well acted. Um, great surprise performance from Matt Damon. And, you know, Tom Hanks is the lead. Who doesn't love that guy? So I just think this movie, really sensational. It's I've seen it many times, and it still, to this day, blows me away every time I see it. Next up, at number 68, I have Chinatown, which was directed by Roman Polanski and came out in 1974. Chinatown is a perfect movie. It's really, uh, if you want to teach someone what a movie is, how to, what a screenplay should look like, what uh, directing is, I mean, Chinatown is a perfect example of all of it. Jack Nicholson is really terrific. Faye Dunaway is awesome. John Huston. Uh, uh, but Roman Polanski's directing is really, really sensational. The story is fascinating, based on a true story, um, true events of L.A. You know, we live in L.A., so, you know, there's always shortage of water. But this this film is one of the greatest noir films, you know, and it's just well, well, so well crafted. It's really terrific. Next up, at number 67, I have The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. It came out in 2001 and directed by Peter Jackson. This is my favorite Lord of the Rings film. I think it's the the best of the trilogy. I know that Return of the King got all the Oscars, and I think that it's mainly because it was the last one. I mean, it's kind of silly to look at Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring and see that it like hardly won any awards at all. It got nominated for some stuff, but like it really is an amazing story. It's I just I love because this story because in, in the other two you know the story is already going on, but with this one to start in the Shire and to to end where it ends. 
the transformation and the journey of the characters, the introduction of the world, you know, where an audience, and this is all new to us. I love that sense of discovery about like, you know, like I, my favorite Harry Potter film is the first one, that sense of discovery of entering the world for the first time, the fish out of water. And, you know, I mean, iconic cast, iconic moments, really, really just perfect craftsmanship by Peter Jackson, beautiful filmmaking on location work, uh, as little CGI as he could possibly use. And, I mean, great special effects, great makeup. Like, this is all around a terrific picture. At number 66, I have Blade Runner, which came out in 1982, directed by Ridley Scott, another Ridley Scott film. Now, I was thinking about putting the other Blade Runner, the sequel, in this, but there's something about the original Blade Runner, Blade Runner that is just so special because he did it so long ago with such limited resources. You know, I mean, they were borrowing pieces of sets from other films to make the city. I mean, just the practicality and the miniatures. Building this world back then, it seems impossible now when you look back at it, but somehow, you know, really Scott pulled it off. And on top of that, beautiful production design. You have sensational cinematography, a blend of the New York, the New York with sci-fi, a terrific lead performance by one of the greatest leads of all time, Harrison Ford. And, you know, as on the surface, this movie looks like it's just flashy, but it has really great themes of humanity, of understanding what it means to be human, and even, you know, what trying to define what it means to be human. And I think that it asks these questions so well in such a nuanced way, so perfectly done. And when you combine that with great action, great sci-fi, great filmmaking it's just a really special movie special movie it changed sci-fi forever i mean you have star wars and you have blade runner and but before that was 2001 but blade runner really helped define what sci-fi had the potential of being with a darker take and approach next up at number 65 i have the kid which came out in 1921 directed by charlie Ch charlie chaplin charlie chaplin a lot of people they just think he's the guy who you know, the comedic, com comedic silent film actor, but he directed all of his movies. You know, he's the producer of them all. He, they were all his vision. So the guy was a genius. He was also a genius comedian. And the kid, I think, is the, the pinnacle of his work. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's heartwarming. Uh, the sets are really terrific. The, the comedic pieces are really funny. I think that's just Charlie Chaplin firing on all cylinders. And I know silent films aren't, kind of hard for maybe young people to watch but if you're really interested in film charlie chaplin is one of the early masters of filmmaking so you should definitely get into his work at number 64 i have the dark knight <laughs> this came out in 2008 and directed by christopher nolan and i put this on the list it is i'm gonna ruin i'm gonna spoilers right now it's the only comic book movie I have on the on the list. It's the only superhero movie I have the, on the list, and the reason for that is because what Christopher Nolan did with Dark Knight was just revelatory in terms of the genre. Um, I think comic book movies are fun. Uh, they are a good time, and you know, they are what they are. But I just think that in terms of we're talking great cinema, you you don't really see anything in them. Um, it's when you're, I mean, we're characters that are super powered and villains that are super powered or close to it. Or, uh, I mean, it's hard. It doesn't have too much relatability with the real world, with humanity. You know, it's kind of just like, you know, Greek gods of the modern era. And so I didn't put any of those on my list. But I put The Dark Knight on it because it brought the comic book genre into the real world. It, it brought the comic book genre into the real world in a very nuanced way, in a grim, gritty, exciting way. It felt like I wasn't watching a comic book movie. It felt like I was just watching a crime drama. You know what I mean? I think it helps that, you know, the character doesn't have powers and that the villain doesn't have powers. But also, Nolan's approach to the film, his filmmaking, the tone, you know, this is post 9-11, and he turned the Joker into a terrorist. And I think that a lot of audiences, when they saw that, they were like, wow, this feels like it could happen. I feel like 
whenever I see superhero movies, I'm like, I mean, it's a superhero movie. It's not going to happen. It's so unrealistic. But when you watch this movie, I think what's so great about it is that it feels like it could happen. And it feels like the Joker could be a real villain in the world. And we do have villains like that in the world. It's a real thing. So I think that the entire thing as a whole really changed the game. And I don't think that the MCU would be what it was if it didn't have a movie like The Dark Knight and Batman Begins to use as inspiration for itself. So I think Dark Knight has to be on this list and none of the others. No other comic book movie needs to be on this list. Okay, number 63. I have the great 12 Angry Men, directed by Sidney Lumet. And this came out in 1952. 12 Angry Men is probably one of the greatest scripts ever written. You could argue that it is the greatest script ever written. It's a really terrific story. It's about um, 12 jurors who are trying to carry out a guilty verdict on this young black boy who they think committed a murder. And then there's one juror who's questioning it and will ref- and refuses to go along with the, the verdict. And then he tries to convince the 11 other men that this boy could be innocent. Really, really amazing movie. So well crafted. It takes place in the one room, but yet Sidney Lumet manages to keep the filmmaking interesting, keeps the audience pulled in, and also that's a testament to the amazing acting on display too. So 12 Angry Men, definitely it's got to be on this list. At number 62, I have Eraserhead. David Lynch directed this film. It came out in 1977. Excuse me. This film is crazy. I know David Lynch has made some great movies. Like you got Mulholland Drive, Blue Velvet, uh, the Twin Peaks series. But they don't, I don't think they even come close to this one. This one is really probably the most creative film ever made. Not just with the visuals, but with the sound design too. It's really, really sensational sound design. But um, David Lynch all at the same time disturbs you. Intrigues you, makes you laugh, makes you question existence and everything. You've never seen anything like this movie. It's really, really stunning. I think that it's Lynch's best film to this day. He hasn't topped it. At number 61, I have Parasite, which came out in 2019. It was directed by Bong Joon-ho. I think uh, most of you have seen this since it was a, such a big deal when it came out. It's a relatively new release and best film of that year and hands down one of the best films of the century so far I think that it's a really terrific script so surprising so shocking and then Bong Joon-ho's directing and filmmaking is just like out of this world it's perfect it's so well done so meticulously detailed the more times you watch it the more you take away from it and like all of his films has real substance to it has a lot to say about important topics, especially in his country of South Korea. And, I mean, this movie just knocked... It. I saw it in theaters by myself, and I was sat in the theater as the credits rolled, like, like stunned. I couldn't believe how good this movie was. Number 60, A Clockwork Orange. This film was directed by Stanley Kubrick. came out in 1971. This book is really great. It's hard to read, but it's really great. And then Stanley Kubrick's depiction of it is just groundbreaking it's i'm not sure it gets enough love because it really i think changed the game in terms of storytelling uh stanley kubrick the genius of him and what makes him possibly the best of all time is that all of his films are so different every film is a different genre and i think that for dystopian future dramas films i mean there's nothing better than this one and then alex is such a fascinating lead character the world that he created was just incredible, it's terrifying, funny, bizarre, strange, surreal. You know, so many things are going on in this film. The craftsmanship is just out of this world, and I love the design of this film and the tone. It has this. This movie has a strange tone that I think it's the only thing that ever. No other movie feels like this movie feels. It's hard to to really pin it down, but it is wholly unique. I think. All right, now at number 59, I have The Social Network, which came out in 2010, directed by David Fincher, written by Aaron Sorkin. Uh, I think this is the best screenplay of the century. Uh, Aaron Sorkin's best work. (coughs) Excuse me. Aaron Sorkin's best work 
David Fincher's, you could say, best work. Uh, I just think when news came about of this film in pre-production that they were making a Facebook movie, I was like, what? Who wants to see a movie about Facebook? And then when David Fincher signed on, I was like, hold the phone. What? Okay, this is going to be something, I bet. And this movie, I think, just blew everyone away. I think everyone was shocked at how good it was. It's kind of s- surreal and funny that you look back on it that this movie, it didn't win like any Oscars, I don't think. Um, maybe, did Aaron Sorkin win screen, screenplay? I'm not sure. But I mean, how did David Fincher not win director? How did it not win best picture? Uh, I mean... And even Jesse Eisenberg was really terrific. Andrew Garfield, Justin Timberlake. I mean, this movie is just perfect. It's such a fascinating story. I think that, you know, on Facebook, when it was was in its early days and Zuckerberg was like this rising star and success story, nobody, nobody knew how crazy the story was of how Facebook began. And so uh, David Fincher's filmmaking and Aaron Sorkin's screenplay is just really special. And, I think this will go down as one of the best films of the century in the future, for sure. All right. At number 58. Wow, we're cruising along. I have Touch of Evil, which was directed by Orson Welles. This came out in 1958. Orson Welles is one of the greats. Um, He didn't direct too many movies, but, I mean, the guy made some of the greatest of all time, and I think that Touch of Evil gets slept on a lot. It's really, really terrific. It's such a great dark, disturbing, grim film. Unbelievable filmmaking. Some really, really terrific camera work. Like he was like changing things as he made films and he was like creating new ways of filming and like the long takes in this and the approach to his filmmaking and the lighting. Really sensational and, you know, really revolutionary in its time. This is a really great dark film. I think you definitely got to check it out. If you like movies like David Fincher movies, you would love Touch of Evil. All right, at number 57, I have It's a Wonderful Life, which came out in 1946, directed by Frank Capra, stars Jimmy Stewart. I think you've all seen this film. It's really one of the most beloved films of all time for a reason. It's such a beautiful film. It's so moving. Um, It's a great movie to watch with your family. Uh, I just think that it encapsulates so much of the human, human experience and the goodness in humanity that we have deep inside. Really, really terrific film. Frank Happer is an awesome director. All right, number 56, I have Alien. This came out in 1979, directed by Ridley Scott. Uh, It's definitely one of the best sci-fi movies of all time, one of the best horror films of all time. Uh, It's really terrific. The first time I saw it, it blew me away, terrified me. The design of the alien, I think, is the best creature design ever put on film. I don't think anyone has topped it, and I'm not sure if anyone will ever top it. I mean, the xenomorph is just, what a perfect creature. Ridley Scott's directing, you know, the screenplay is just really good. The special effects still hold up, and I mean, Sigourney Weaver as Ripley is just like one of the best heroes of all time, like top action hero, like definitely like top five, like um, amazing, amazing character. And I think this film is perfect. It's so, so good. Gotta check it out. All right, number 55, I have Children of Men, which came out in 2006, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. One second. You gotta hydrate all this talking without stopping. <clears throat> Children of Men is one of my favorite movies. It also was very influential in me when I was a young person. I saw this and was just completely blown away by it. Alfonso's filmmaking, the handheld style, the very long takes, I mean, and also the blending of, of camera angles. Clive Owen's great. Really terrific dystopian future. Uh, believable. Great concept. It's got some of the greatest action sequences of all time, whether it be like that 10-minute long take in the third act or um, the car sequence when Julian and Moore's character, you know what, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it. But it's a really beautiful film. Uh, so, so well-crafted. I mean, Alfonso Cuaron... He's one of the best to ever do it, and it's ama- amazing, his body of work already. It's really sensational. If you haven't seen it, you got to watch Children of Men. Number 54, I have Pulp Fiction, which came out in 1994, written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. Uh, this movie changed the game a lot of, in a lot of ways in the 90s. Um, 
in the eighties, cinema got a little boring. I mean, there are still people like Brian De Palma making cool movies and stuff, but Tarantino really like lit the world on fire with this, and he became you know a rock star. It's such an original movie, really amazing characters, the interweaving story, the way he filmed it, the music. I mean, this is quintessential Tarantino, and he really made his stamp on the world with this film. Amazing, amazing film. All right, now at number 53, yes, 53, Vivre Sa Vie, and this came out in 1962, directed by Jean-Luc Godard. This movie was really important. The French New Wave movement uh, really changed the name, changed the style of filmmaking that was going on. He was, Godard was like breaking boundaries, making films his own way, defying the rules. Really, really beautiful film. Romance, drama, crime. I mean, it's got it all. Really, really terrific. And then at number 52, I have Pan's Labyrinth, which came out in 2006, directed by Guillermo del Toro. I think this is del Toro's best film. It's a beautiful adult fairy tale, fantasy, great blend of um, fantasy, horror, gore, creature, monsters. I mean, it's so much fun what he did. I think that the cinematography is really remarkable and terrific score. Then at number 51, I have Cold War, which came out in 2018. This is directed by Pavel Palakowski. This was actually nominated for Best uh, Picture, and he was nominated for Best Director. It's really... It's an amazing movie. It felt like the way he filmed it and his approach to the story, it made it feel like it was made in the 40s. And he did really something really special. It's got great romance, great drama, tragedy. Some of the best cinematography I've seen in a long time. Really original, great costuming, terrific performances. Really, really original and unique, unique tale about love. So... If you haven't seen Cold War, I highly recommend it. It's a Polish film. At number 50, wow, halfway, here we go. I have Rosemary's Baby, which came out in 1968. This was directed by Roman Polanski, one of the best horror films of all time. Uh, Mia Farrow is really sensational. It's a terrifying film. It's thrilling. And Polanski, I think his greatest talent is his ability to build suspense and put uh, put the audience in dread and on the edge of their seat. And Rosemary's Baby is really amazing. I'm going to move a little faster. I think I was going too slow at first because this is going pretty long. All right, number 49, I have Cinema Paradiso, which came out in 1988, directed by Giuseppe Tornatore. This is a really terrific Italian film. It's basically like a celebration of film and, you know, going to the film picture house and cinemas and theaters and and it's a beautiful film. One of the best scores ever by Ennio Morricone. Terrific cinematography. Heartwarming tale. It's just a good, feel-good movie. If you're a lover of film, you would love Cinema Paradiso. Number 48, I have Vertigo, which came out in 1958. Directed by Alfred Hitchcock. One of his greatest films. Uh, terrific, terrific story. Suspense. Great craftsmanship and filmmaking and style. He, you know, pioneered that dolly zoom where that famous shot in jaws where he zooms in on him but the background expands albert hitchcock kind of pioneered it in this film really really terrific amazing score love it love it great espionage element to it too number 47 i have a trip to the moon this came out in 1902 it was directed by george miles this is actually a short film i think it's only like 12 or 13 minutes long but it was very important to film history what Miles did was he basically took the the idea of filmmaking and back then it was they weren't coming out with like big movies often like film was still very new and in its infancy but he saw the potential and the power of it where he's an illusionist and so he used the movie he used film to create illusions and to achieve like magic especially like visual effects special effects and he built these amazing sets and these cool costume designs and just like created these amazing sci-fi movies fantasy movies like really groundbreaking stuff and you know he's really one of the greatest pioneers of filmmaking of all time and tragically he wasn't really well known until his later years and after his death and now he's widely celebrated but he's very instrumental in the development of filmmaking Number 46, 
I Have the Matrix, which came out in 1999, directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski. What the Wachowskis did was just revolutionary. I saw this for the first time as a kid and was just like floored. It's a perfect movie, perfect screenplay, amazing, amazing idea and concept. The approach, the cinematography, Keanu Reeves is perfect, you know, terrific cast, special effects, bullet time, slow mo, all that stuff. Like, never seen anything like it before. From start to finish, it's just really perfect. Number 45, I have Chung King Express, which came out in 1994, directed by Wang Kar Wai. This is an amazing Chinese film. Wang Kar Wai is one of my favorite filmmakers. It's so well done. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cinematography. Great characters. It's so funny, so heartwarming, so full of romance. I love it. I love this. When you watch this movie, it just like makes you smile. And when the credits roll and that song plays, it's just like you get all warm and bubbly inside. It's just such a terrific film. I couldn't recommend it enough. Number 44, I have Apocalypse Now, which came out in 1979, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Um, this, I think this is the best war film ever made. It's so different from any other war film. Uh, Coppola's, Coppola's approach is really unique, crazy, beautiful cinematography. Some, it's got some of the most iconic shots of all time in this film. I can't believe he even pulled this off. It's like, I, I know he went through hell to make this movie, but honestly, it was worth it because of how just like unbelievable this film is. Number 43, I have Amour, which came out in 2012, directed by Michael Haneke. Another Haneke film. This is a, a French film. And it's about an elderly couple, a high class, both uh, artists. And then one day the the wife begins showing symptoms of dementia. And then eventually she slowly devolves into intense dementia. And it's really a tragic tale of the husband learning to deal with it, um, trying to take care of her, and trying to keep their home. Beautiful, beautiful film. So tragic, so well acted and well crafted by Haneke. It's unbelievable. If anyone who knows a grandparent or parent who's gone through dementia or Alzheimer's, this is definitely a movie you should check out. Next up at 42, <clears throat> excuse me, I have Casablanca, which came out in 1942. <clears throat> hey, 42 came out in 1942. This was directed by Michael Curtis. Obviously, super famous film. We all know the lines. This film, just terrific cast, great, great filmmaking, iconic moments, iconic story, uh, the ending, everything about it. You know, this is one of the greatest of all time. You have to pay your respect to movies like this because this has such a great influence and impact on cinema going forward. Next up at 41, I Have No Country for Old Men. Came out in 2007, directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen. I think this is the Coen Brothers' greatest achievement in filmmaking. It's the great water, modern western. Really a perfect film. Nothing about it. I can't say a bad word about it. You have one of the greatest villains ever put on screen by Javier Bardem. Bardem's performance is just like, you look back on it. Every time I watch this movie, I'm like, this guy, just unbelievable what he did with this character. Tommy Lee Jones is actually so sensational, too. But the filmmaking is really special. For the Coens, like, this is the, the pinnacle. This is the peak of their mountain. And they've made some amazing movies. And Roger Deakins, this is one of his best shot films for sure. Really, really terrific movie. One of my favorites. At number 40, I have Days of Heaven. This came out in 1978, directed by Terrence Malick. Uh, M Malick's one of my favorite filmmakers. Days of Heaven was really ahead of its time. Uh, beautiful cinematography, but also his approach to the story, um, kind of nonlinear, kind of breaking the rules, doing it his own way, not following, not strictly following a traditional story, but it does it. It does have a, a main plot, but I think that this, these are the early days of Moloch, and it's such a beautiful film. It's so great. You gotta check it out. Number thirty nine. I have The Exorcist came out in 1973, directed by William Friedkin, very underrated director. The Exorcist, I think, is the most terrifying film ever made. I think it, no other horror film will ever top it. And even to this day, when I watch this movie, it still disturbs me. And, you know, William Friedkin's directing is perfect. The, the special effects, 
I know it's kind of like kind of looks cheesy now, but there's no CGI. You know, it's, it's just it's all there. It's all real. It's all practical, and it really works. I think it still holds up, and I think it's scarier than any CGI scary movie BS that comes out nowadays. This movie really shocks you to your core, and I saw this in theaters. And it really was like one of the greatest movie theater experiences of my life. It's really an unbelievable movie. I think it's criminally underrated. I think it's just so well done. The Exorcist. Number 38, I Have Nostalgia, another Andrei Tarkovsky film, which came out in 1983. Again, beautiful cinematography, like some of the best ever. A difficult story to follow. The more times you watch it, the better it gets, and the more you take away from it. As you follow this man on his journey, the filmmaking is just like so masterful in the music and Tarkovsky's approach to it. It feels more like it's like an abstract painting or like poetry as opposed to like just a normal narrative. It's really special. Number 37, I have The 400 Blows. This came out in 1959, directed by Francois Truff- Truffaut. And then Truffaut is one of France's greatest directors, him and Jean-Luc Godard were very vital to France's development in cinema. And The 400 Blows is one of the greatest coming-of-age films of all time. Really tragic, really really dramatic, and beautiful. You know, Truffaut brought his camera and cast and crew, and they just, like, filmed in random locations and, you know, kind of went with it as a guerrilla style, you could say, and didn't have a traditional plot. It's more about this young boy and, you know, his life, it's really beautiful. Number 36, I have Silence of the Lambs, which came out in 1991, directed by Jonathan Demme. Uh, unbelievable film. I think it's one of the greatest crime dramas, investigation dramas, and serial killer dramas ever. You got two of the best performances of all time up there. Not best ever, but in, like, the discussion for best ever with both Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster. It's a really superb film, really amazing stuff. At 35, I have Jaws by Steven Spielberg. came out in 1975. It's a lot, this movie is a lot more masterful than people give it credit for. It's so well directed, so scary, music. It's, it's over in, in Boston, kid. <laughs> and I just really adore this film. I think it's one of the best ever made. Number 34, I have The Master, which came out in 2012, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, one of his masterpieces. Um, the cast is absurd. Amy Adams, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Joaquin Phoenix. Cinematography is some of the best I've seen in a long time. Uh, it's really interesting, intriguing story. Uh, kind of doesn't have a traditional plot. It's more of a character piece, which I like. And it's just, this movie gives you a feeling. And when you when I watch this movie, like I just feel so interested and so fascinated by the world that he created. Then at number 33, I have The Piano Teacher, which came out in 2001, directed by Michael Haneke, another Haneke film. This is one of the most interesting films I've ever seen, one of the most shocking films I've ever seen, one of the most unpredictable films I've ever seen. I think so many filmmakers and so many people kind of avoid sex in movies, but Haneke is like full on, like, this is a part of life. Let's just go into it. It's graphic. It's shocking. It can be disturbing. But, you know, I think it's a great character piece. And Isabel Hubert is a, one of the greatest actors of all time, and she gives an astounding lead performance. It's such a shocking film. Uh, the ending is just like, whoa, what the hell? And I think if you haven't seen it, you've got to check it out, The Piano Teacher. Amazing, amazing movie. Number 32, I have Glorious Bastards. Came out in 2009, directed by Quentin Tarantino. I think this is Tarantino's best film. You have two of the greatest scenes ever written, the opening scene and then the the bar basement scene. I mean, it, what sensational screenwriting. And I just think that this really is his masterpiece. He even says it basically at the end when Brad Pitt's character looks into the camera and says, I think this might be my masterpiece. He's That's Tarantino saying, I think this is my masterpiece. At number 31, I have Raging Bull, which came out in 1980, directed by Martin Scorsese. This is the greatest sports film ever made. It's one of the greatest character pieces ever made. Jake LaMotta was such a complex character. And, you know, he is both the hero and the villain of his story. And Scorsese's approach to the film was so dynamic. 
so visually stunning, so beautiful. The black and white footage, um, his use of really great camera techniques, lighting, smoke. I mean, you never see anything like it. And then De Niro, this is De Niro's best performance. It's one of the greatest performances of all time. It could be. You could make the argument in the case that it's the greatest of all time. It's really sensational. At number 30, wow, we're getting pretty low. I have Dr. Zhivago, which came out in 1965, directed by the great David Lean. This is an iconic film. It's such a great, sprawling, epic, uh, beautiful filmmaking, terrific sets, terrific lead actor and supporting cast. Fascinating, fascinating movie. It's David Lean's one of the greatest directors to come out of the UK ever, and possibly the best. And man, this is definitely one of his masterpieces. At number 29, I have La Dolce Vita, which came out in 1960, directed by Federico Fellini. Um, one of my favorite directors from Italy, La Dolce Vita, is beautiful, romantic, lush cinematography, like massive sets. So cool. Um, beautiful, beautiful black and white film. you got to check it out. Then, okay, i got to move a little bit faster or else I'll never finish this list. Number 28, I have Ivan's Childhood, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky again, which came out in 1962. Another great black and white film. Beautiful cinematography. I mean, you, some of the shots in this movie are so iconic. You'll see, like, and you can see how so many filmmakers drew from Tarkovsky and his camera work. Really dark film um, set in the Nazi era. Uh, really terrific acting. Uh, sensational. This is These are the early days of Tarkovsky, and you can see his approach. Very reminiscent of, you know, Terrence Malick, I think, drew a lot of inspiration from Tarkovsky films, and this is one of his best, too. Number 27, The Good and the Bad and the Ugly. Uh best western ever made not the hotel <laughs> this came out in 1966 directed by sergio leone iconic it has some of the greatest cinematography you've ever seen uh, his brilliant idea and concept of of cutting from intense close-ups of people's eyes to sprawling wide shots back and forth back and forth some of the greatest editing you've ever seen the the climax you could say is one of the best made scenes of all time in terms of the all-around approach to it the, uh, the filmmaking, the editing, cinematography, the directing, and the acting, and the script. Beautiful score, too. Such, such an iconic score. Number 26, I have The Godfather Part Two, 1974, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Coppola. This is, you know, one of the greatest American films ever made. I have it this high. Um, you'll see, I'll, I'll explain when I announce Godfather later on, but... Part two, I think it's one of the greatest films ever made. Ever made, you know, you got De Niro now in this story as a young Vito, and then Michael Corleone's fully fledged like this villainous antihero. Really fascinating performance from Al Pacino again. You know, Diane Keaton cinematography. Gordon Willis, one of the best cinematographers ever, shot these really tragic, like Shakespearean, you know. Hamlet type story, you know, this man on this quest of power. Number 25, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. This came out in 1920, uh, directed by Robert Wien. This is one of the greatest films ever made in terms of the production, the cinematography, the creation of these beautiful sets, the surrealist quality in nature, the Dutch angles, the bizarre. Um, this really pushed the boundaries of what filmmaking could be in terms of the art form. And then number 24, I have Rosetta, which came out in 1999, directed by Jean-Pierre and Luc Dardenne, the Dardenne brothers, which we had a film on earlier. This is one of the greatest character pieces ever made. Like a, like the other film, L'Enfant, this film was shot documentary style. It's very simple. Um, it makes you feel like you know this character, makes you feel like you're there with her. The long takes, such a tragic story, such a powerful film. Um, I think it's really sensational. It's one of my favorite movies. This movie also, I saw it when I was young, and it's one of the first international films I ever saw. It might be the first one I saw, and it really stunned me. Number 23, A Long Day's Journey Into Night, which came out in 2018, directed by Bi Gun. <clears throat> Bi Gun. I think that's how you say it. I'm sorry, I don't speak Chinese. This movie is so powerful, so sprawling, so engrossing, some beautiful cinematography, great acting, mysterious story. The way he tells the story, it feels so hypnotic and entrancing. And then, but what really makes this movie special is the, the final 
um, 60 minutes. There's like the exact minute. It's like a 54 minute long take and it's a real long take that they filmed. And it starts in a cave and then the camera and character travel all over the place, across a village, over a village, like 200 feet in the air, down this crazy wire. You see people playing pool. You see like a little toy car being driven around carrying something. Um, the, the, the scale of what's being performed in this one shot is so amazing. Every time I watch it, I'm just stunned that they achieved this shot. And it's not blended together with a bunch of cuts. It's literally, for real, a long take. No tricks, no gimmicks. And it's really some of the greatest filmmaking I've seen in a long time. A long day's journey in tonight. Gotta watch it. At number 22, I have Schindler's List, which came out in 1993, directed by Steven Spielberg. You know, I think it's the greatest film, the, the greatest World War II film um, depicting what the Nazis were doing. Spielberg's best film, Liam Neeson, amazing. Such a terrific story to tell. You know, it's a, a dark film, a, a film that shows the dark and the light of humanity. And it's one of the most important films ever made. And he really did something really special with this film. At number 21, I have Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese. This film came out in 1990. I think Goodfellas is the most entertaining film ever made. It's my most watched movie. I could watch it over and over and over again. It, the characters, the jokes, the the energy, the narration, the world building. I mean, I just adore this film. It's so amazing. At number 20, I have Roma, which came out in 2018, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Another Cuaron film. I think this is one of the most beautiful films ever made. Um, it's a personal film for him. He, he made it for his mom. It's about his mom's life and you know, the house that he grew up in. So it's deeply personal, really expert filmmaking and craftsmanship. He actually did the cinematography himself, and it's just such a, a knockout of a movie. Uh, I think it's kind of flying under the radar because it came out on Netflix, but I think in time people will understand how important this film was. Number 19, I have Psycho, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> directed by Alfred Hitchcock. This film came out in 1960. You know, this film changed the game. It's got one of the best twists of all time. If It could be the best twist ever. Beautiful filmmaking. Terrific performance by Anthony Perkins and Janet Lee. Such a great engrossing story. Number 18, I have The Seventh Seal. Directed by Ingmar Bergman. This came out in 1957. This is instrumental to international films being successful in America. This is a very big hit for, in terms of the time. Amazing filmmaking. This about a story of a, it's a story of a man who plays chess with the with death as a way of trying to outwit him and save his life and really incredible imagery powerful themes so well done number 17 i have breathless by jean-luc godard which came out in 1960 this is i think the greatest french new wave movie uh jean-luc godard's masterpiece beautiful filmmaking terrific cast um romance it's so well done the the the, the filmmaking in this is just whatever he wanted to do. He was like, I'm going to put a camera here and film this. I'm going to film her back. And um, the the relationship, it feels so real and authentic. Um, the character pieces of both the lead and the lead lead actor and the lead actress. It feels like real. you're watching real people in this film. And I think that's what his, the whole point of it was, to make it feel like this isn't some, some sensationalized Hollywood picture, studio picture. This is like... Uh, we're just trying to capture reality and create something that you can really relate to. Number 16, I have Tokyo Story, which came out in 1953, directed by Yasujiro Otsu. Now, Otsu is one of Japan's greatest filmmakers. This story is deeply tragic, deeply moving, beautiful, amazing sets, amazing camera work, amazing costumes. It's about this um, older couple who go to the city to visit their children, and their children are too busy and uninterested to really pay them any attention. And it's, you know, it's tragic, you know, the way they see their children have changed. Um, it's a very heartbreaking film. Uh, it's a beautiful film, though. You got to check it out. Number 15, I have The Bicycle Thief. Came out in 1948, directed by Vittorio De Sica. This is uh, one of the greatest Italian films ever made. Uh, it's about uh, a man whose um, bike gets stolen. 
and he used it to get to work. And so he and his young son set out to look for it because if they can't find it, they're going to starve. And, you know, it's about poverty. And it's a tough time to live for anyone back then. Um, most of the world was in poverty. But also it's got so much heart, um, so much emotional depth to it. Uh, really terrific filmmaking. Check out The Bicycle Thief. Number 14, I have The Godfather. This came out in 1972, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Now, I put this movie ahead of Godfather Part 2 because I think Godfather is the superior film because of Michael. Michael's transformation in The Godfather to go from this young, naive, um, innocent, righteous man to becoming a full-on villain killer um, who enjoys the power he gains. What a great transformation and one of the greatest uh, character pieces ever put on film. I think that's what really makes The Godfather so special. And Godfather's Part 2 is really amazing as well. But I think The Godfather is really, really great. Number 13, I have In the Mood for Love. This came out in 2000 and was directed by Juan Kar Wai. This is the greatest romance film ever made. And ironically, you don't see the two characters um, get physically intimate at all. Um, but that's the whole point. That's about uh, a man and a woman who are n uh, neighbors, and both of their spouses are in, affair, are in an affair together. And they both discover this, and they kind of form like this bond, this kind of friendship and uh, an intimacy, not physically, but, you know, emotionally and personally. And, you know, it's a really fascinating story. It's so beautifully well made, and the colors, the costuming, the cinematography, the sets, um, the acting, really, really remarkable. Um, it's a really special movie. Uh, the first time I saw it, it really stunned me. I'd never seen anything like it before. Um, I highly recommend you check out In the Mood for Love. Number 12, I Have Metropolis, which came out in 1927, directed by Fritz Lang. This movie is so important. Uh, what Fritz Lang did was, I mean, you look at it now and you're like, how did he do this? He built these amazing sets I mean, without CGI, it's all practical with just like the simplest forms of filmmaking. And it's about this highly industrious world. And, you know, it has a lot to say in terms of like factory work, in terms of capitalism, in terms of, you know, classism. Um, it's really remarkable what happened with this film. It's so influential. Uh, it's so important. And it's just, just still to this day so breathtaking. <clears throat> my voice keeps cracking. I'm used to Jim feeding me lines too so I can get a break. <clears throat> All right. Oh, we're closing in. At number 11, I have Citizen Kane, which came out in 1941, directed by Orson Welles. Uh, it's one of the greatest film movies of all time, the cinematography, production design. Orson Welles, it's crazy. He was 26 years old when he wrote, directed, and starred in this movie. It's just hard to believe that he pulled this off. And it really is... It deserves all of the recognition it has. It's so highly regarded, but it really is one of the greatest films ever crafted. At number 10, I have Rear Window, which came out in 1954, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. I think this is Hitchcock's masterpiece, his greatest masterpiece. Um, this film is so suspenseful, so intriguing, so mysterious, so thrilling, so fantastic, and yet it's all set in one room. And... It's hard to believe, but it works so well. Uh, Jimmy Stewart is really great. Grace Kelly was awesome. I mean, it's just an amazing, amazing movie. You have to just, you have to check it out. You got to do it, guys. You got to do it. At number nine, I have There Will Be Blood, which came out in 2007, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. This is my personal favorite film. And what Paul Thomas Anderson did was really special. Daniel day Lewis's acting was just probably, I would say, the greatest performance of all time. Um, cinematography, production design, the story, the setting, the music, John Greenwood's score. Wow. Robert Ellswood's camera work. I think that this movie just is firing on all cylinders. It's really remarkable. At 8, I have 2001, A Space Odyssey, directed by Stanley Kubrick. This film came out in 1968. This is the greatest sci-fi film ever made. 
um, one of the greatest films ever made, just generally speaking. Um, the cinematography, the set design, special effects, the visual effects. You know, no one was ready for what Kubrick did. He changed the game forever. And like I said, every one of his movies is a completely different genre. You know, Star Wars wouldn't exist if it wasn't for 2001. You know, sci-fi wouldn't be what it is today without 2001. It had such a heavy impact on on film. And, you know, it's just such an utter masterpiece. At number seven, I have Mirror, or also known as The Mirror, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. This came out in 1975. Another Tarkovsky film, I think, is his greatest work. Um, I think it could be the greatest cinematography up there in this discussion of all time. Such beautiful filmmaking. Such a deep, meditative film. Uh, it's so, so well done. It's just unbelievable what this guy was doing. Check it out. Number six, I have Seven Samurai, directed by Akira Kurosawa, which came out in 1954. Um, unbelievable movie. Uh, one of the greatest films of all time. The cinematography, the story. You've seen so many like bands of warriors getting together to defend something. It all started with this film. Um, the craftsmanship. I love Samurai. Akira Kurosawa, one of the greatest of all time. Number five. Lawrence of Arabia. This came out in 1962, directed by David Lean. This movie is just super special. It's like a miracle of a film. David Lean, I mean, he filmed a mirage for real. It's just crazy. The filmmaking, the scale of it, the scope. Um, T.E. Lawrence was a really fascinating character. Peter O'Toole, one of the greatest performances of all time. I mean, this movie is just the definition of epic. Number four. Okay, we're getting there. I have Taxi Driver, which came out in 1976, directed by Martin Scorsese. This is his masterpiece. It's one of the greatest films ever made. It's the greatest character piece ever made. Uh, Robert De Niro's greatest performance. Uh, this is just... No one's ever made a film like it. I, mean, I try to look back on history and like nothing could even compare to Taxi Driver. It's really special. And I think it will be regarded as one of the greatest of all time forever and I've seen this movie many many times and still to this day whenever I watch it I'm just hypnotized by its mastery number three I have eight and a half which was directed by Federico Fellini and came out in 1963 uh, this is one of the most creative inspiring um, fascinating beautiful films ever made uh, Guido is such a cool character uh, the the approach to the filmmaking, the surrealist, dreamlike quality, um, the flashbacks, the dreamlike state you always feel like you're in when you're watching this movie. You never really feel like you're even ever in reality. And you're always like, when I watch this movie, I'm like, is the whole thing a dream? It's like, it's so endlessly fascinating. Some of the greatest sets ever put on, on film. Some of the greatest cinematography of all time. Uh, Fellini is one of the best to ever do it. This is a really sensational movie, a really important movie. And, you know, makes me proud to be an Italian when I watch a movie like this. At number two, I have The Tree of Life, which came out in 2011. This film was directed by Terrence Malick. The Tree of Life is a really important movie to me. I saw it in theaters for the first time, and it really, you know, made me <laughs> think about everything. Think about life, think about existence. Uh, our place in the universe, not just in the world. It made me think about consciousness and spirituality and, you know, science and religion. And what Malik did with this film um, had never been done before. You know, he took the expansive, you know, almost endless, infinite scope of the universe and he juxtaposed it with the intimate nature of a small family in the Midwest and, you know, this is a really beautiful film. I think it's the most beautifully shot film possibly. It's got terrific music, uh, special effects, great actors, you know, Brad Pitt, and Jessica Chastain, Sean Penn. Um, you know, Malik's a special director. He's like a, a great painter. His movies aren't for everyone, but um, movies like this, movies like Days of Heaven, they really are sensational. And I think that The Tree of Life is one of the most remarkable pieces of cinema ever created my pick for the greatest film ever made 
is Fanny and Alexander. This film came out in 1982 and was directed by Ingmar Bergman, the master Swedish director. This movie, I'm I'm not sure if any if all of you have seen this film, but uh, you should watch it as soon as possible. I think it's the ultimate depiction of what the craft of filmmaking can do. It feels like a great Shakespearean epic, a tragedy, um, and yet an intimate family drama. Magnificent visuals, just costuming, the, the set pieces, the feeling that you get, what I get when I watch this movie is unlike any other film. It's a long film. It's three and a half hours long. It's three and a half hours long. And there's also actually the, the full cut of it is over five hours long. They made it a miniseries in Sweden. Um, this film is beautiful. It's so tragic. It's powerful. You know, it's got a terrifying villain and such beautiful characters and shows the loss of innocence, you know, death, life, existence, beauty, anguish. There's so, so many layers to this film and there's so much to it. It's hard to take in at once. You have to watch it multiple times to really fully grasp what Bergman did. And, you know, he's he's a master. He was the master, one of the masters of filmmaking. And I think that this was his, you know, final calling card of like, I'm going to do everything that I, I've learned by making films and put it into this film. And I think it's his most personal film. And I think it's his greatest film. And I think it, I really do think it's the greatest film ever made. Uh, it, it's so... It's at times both personal and so epic and beautiful and horrifying. It's, it's lush with color and then grim and desaturated. You know, he really makes you feel exactly what the characters are feeling just through the visuals. Um, it's really, what a remarkable piece of filmmaking. What a unbelievable story approach to the craft and you know it's movies like this that make you really love film and its potential and so I think that Fanny and Alexander is the greatest film ever made all right for those of you who tune into this episode thank you thank you for uh, listening to my list it was kind of weird hosting the show by myself I think I lost my voice with from talking for an hour and a half nonstop. I don't know how other podcasters do it. So James is going to be doing his list next Tuesday. So keep an eye out for this and uh, let me know in the comments what you think about my list. Did I miss anything? Let me know what your favorite movies are. And uh, Again, if you haven't seen the movies I've mentioned, definitely check out. These movies are really great. They are, you know, so important to cinema and they define the craft and the art form. And so I think you should definitely, if you haven't, Expose yourself to as many of these movies as possible. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.